preparing to live stream. So I'll wait until it's stopped doing the timing bit, setting up meeting, blah, 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 blah. So it's doing it now. So I'm just going to close. <laughs> okay. Hello, I'm Anne-Marie Pierman, and I'm joined today by um, Rob Cook. He is originally from Birmingham, Alabama. Um, he was part of a gang as a youth, and then he spent had a successful 21-year career as um, in the Air Force. And after leaving the Air Force, um, since then, he's become a host of the We're Listening podcast, which I believe is in all, on all good um, podcast streaming facilities. And he's also a transformational coach. And after this, um, just to let you know, Rob, I'll, any links to your website and to the podcast I put on the um, description um, once okay. this goes live. So just so that you know. I appreciate so, that. Thank you. That's okay. And um, so just starting off with the first question then. Um, so how did your life look like before you came across the three principles understanding and what does it look like now? <laughs> um, I, I can't really tell you what it looked like before because I didn't see it. I wasn't even aware. It was, it was just happening to me. It was all like you're just throwing a pail of water. You remember the ice bucket challenge? Where, where people would just let water, that's what it felt like. That's what life felt like. Like every moment felt like I was just trying to gas my breath just to make it to the next. Um, and then it wasn't until coming into this understanding and being able to kind of step back and observe life a little to see. Um, and it's, it's weird because it's starting to rewrite my past. You're right. I, I, I was born and raised in the inner city. I was, um, and I, I make the joke now, but I didn't join a game because I was a bad kid. I joined a game because it was a math equation. I'm either going to have to fight these guys every day or I can fight them once and they're my friends. <laughs> That's just smart, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, but it wasn't like I really wanted to be part of the lifestyle. Just, it was all that was around me. Um, no one was, was saying, you know, there's this wisdom inside of you that you could connect to and do something different. No one was saying, you know, you're not broken. So I kind of took to those devices and um, was an athlete and, and really thought that would be my opportunity to, to get away from my environment uh, by playing sports, but it ended up being the US military. And that was kind of like the first, I would say the first time I knew some, something could change like so drastically because of the, the mindset that I had to switch from with the way I grew up to the one that made me able to have a successful career within the military was two totally different ways of looking at life. And I didn't know it then, but that was my first time seeing wisdom in action where I could fully go, oh, I, I made up all this stuff before, you know, and then I made this up too, you know, whatever my military career was. Um, but now it really looks like um, just going back over every experience I've ever had and seeing how rich and beautiful it was to teach me something for the moments I have now. You know, I was telling my mom the other day, I was like, you know, you really was the perfect mom for me. And she was like, what? Like, you never said that before. I was like, I know, but I'm, I'm starting to think about it. I was like, yeah, you were super young when you had me. So there wasn't much guidance from you, but that left me to, to learn for myself, which turned out to be so valuable for me in my military career because you were so young when you had me and the, the the spankings or the beatings or whatever you want to call it that people would call child abuse I called when I got into the protection world one of the quickest things that got me promoted was my ability to take a punch like take a punch and keep moving like not stop like get hit maneuver through get on to next mission uh that was again part of my childhood that's how I grew up uh, gunshots didn't scare me when they went off in the military because I'd been exposed to them before. So it was kind of like even living in the, in the hood kind of put me in a position that made me very successful in the military. Well, now when I, I talk, I walk into an environment. If I'm walking into jails like I do with Inside Alliance or Beyond Recovery or anything like that, then gang activity and, and parts of my life that, that were about that really resonates with those guys to see something different. 
when I go into corporations and they want to know about discipline, then the military side of my life turns out to be very, very beneficial. And so now life looks like really, really going back and making sure everything works for my benefit to better humankind. Because I'm through it now. I'm not currently facing it. We're all safe right here at this moment. So anything, any bomb that's ever exploded around me that scared the shit out of me is not blowing up now. You know, any anything I'm, I'm fighting against or warring against, it's obviously been put on hold because I'm not thinking about it while I'm talking to y'all. <laughs> And so it's it's just really waking up to that part of life and, and experiencing it for real. That was a long ass answer, Anne Marie. I'm sorry, but uh... <laughs> sorry. It um, just strikes me thinking about you talking about the military. Would you say that would have made made you a stronger person than if you hadn't gone into the military? What? How do you think your life would have been if you hadn't gone into the military? I, I would say it would be. Um... It would be much similar to the experience of, of the first couple of years. Um, because again, the military was, I was starting to experience things in the military that were untrue of my experience before. So for instance, race relations was taught to me very differently in Birmingham, Alabama. And then I get into the military and, and there's white guys I would meet who were willing to die with me. And it was like, wait, what? Wait, huh? Like there were, and it was just confusing. You know, there were um, things I saw in the military, I did in the military it was like, I mean, just imagine we, we came from, you have basic training and you bring in a black kid from Birmingham, Alabama, inner city kid. Me. We had white guys in there from Idaho. We had Mexican guys in there from like California. And we're from all different parts of the world. But in seven weeks, we all crying, hugging each other, carrying guns, talking about you, my brother. Like the conditioning, like <laughs> the, the, the things they put you in to tear down all of the thinking and then rebuild you together with your teammates. So you actually believe the only way I get through this mission is by this person being next to me. That was like my first realization of how conditioning worked. Because it was like, wait, just a couple of years ago, I wouldn't even have a conversation with you let alone here I am trusting you to shoot over my back now. What is that? Again, learning the narratives and stories can change, you know. But the, the military did a lot as far as unraveling. It was the beginning of the unraveling. And, and so much so I had to unravel from it. Like I was 19 when I went in, I did 21 years. So when I retired, I knew military life much more than I knew civilian life you know, five minutes late for my first job out of the military, I'm very aggressive with clients. Like, don't be five minutes late because that's life or death. And they're like, uh, I just hit traffic. You know, <laughs> I just, just hit a little traffic. You know, I'm like, no, people die. Like, no, they don't, Rob. It's, it's not, they're not dying. You know, <laughs> just hang out at the smoothie bar because I was a personal trainer when I first got out. It was like, Hang out at the smoothie bar. It's okay. You know, you'll be fine. Uh, but yeah, letting all of that go uh, as well. But it did. I don't know if it made me stronger. I would say it gave me a lot more experiences to get to know who I am. That's what I would say it did. And can you tell me about your journey from leaving the military to becoming a coach and starting up your podcast? Yeah. So the the uh, the story of my, my first insight was... Um, to my big mentor, shout out Michael Neal. Uh, I absolutely love that that guy. But we we found ourselves at a dinner party together, and uh, again, to my old way of thinking, I was the only black guy at the party. And so, when I walk in, I, I walk to the back, and I was like, "Oh, you know, I'm the only black guy here, so I just hang out in the back." So my friend was Indian. She's a female like restaurant owner. She owns a bunch of franchise restaurants, and. My wife, her, and Michael's wife all know each other or knew of each other. And, um, and so I just picked up a book in the back and just started reading. And she was like, Rob, go out in front and talk and stop playing. You know, kind of like push me out in front. She says, uh, I says, no, I'm just going to read this book. I said, matter of fact, let me borrow this and I'll bring it back. And she was like, he's in the front. Like, just go talk to him. And I was like, dude, that wrote this book. And so it was creating the impossible. Uh, and so I kind of see who he is, walk in, kind of make a mistake and bump into him. 
by mistake, right? Like to to talk to him. And man, we hit it off. We was like two kids at a at a candy fest amusement park. Like we just talked all night long. And I used to say, and then he, we, we kind of met up once or twice after that. And then he invited me to do an intensive for the for his uh, students at his um, Super Coach Academy to see. But and I used to think it was it was that intensive that I got the first awareness of my thought consciousness as it works for us in our human experience. That was the first time I was fully aware of it. And I used to think that was the moment he changed my life. But again, as I, I talk about going back and look, it actually was the night I met him because I remembered the way he listened to me. It made me want to talk. It, it made me want to lean in and engage. And that was the beginning of me opening up to hear something different, to learn something new. It was the, it was the way he listened to me. He wasn't trying, when I said something, it wasn't a one-up. He wasn't trying to, to do anything but get to know who I was. And it was a, it was a softness to it, but it was weird because I had never experienced it. Like conversations before that, or what do you need? What do I need? How do we work to each other's benefit? I, don't, I ain't got to get to know you. Like, how do we both make out with this? Like, how do we both end with what we need out of this? And so that was the first thing. Second was the actual um, intensive, which was three days. We were in one room and it was streamed live to a room of 50 students next. And it just hit me. It just, it really fell in. And I could see it as clear as day. Um, and the funny part about it is because it hit me so hard in my heart, I never really tried to go about it and understand it intellectually. So I've never played the, the head game of this. Like, so I'm, you, you won't ever really see me arguing with people about this, that, or what this and mine thought. And, uh, you can, I'm on, I get the feeling. I can really feel what it what it's like to love the world and to to know that I'm connected to every other human being that's alive. Like I see that now, you know. And are there moments I forget? Absolutely, like we all do. But the game of life I'm playing right now is just trying to remember a lot quicker. You know, so that's how I got there. And how did you come across the name Unfit, which is the name of your company, coaching ah. business? realizing that actually the beginning of all my suffering was trying to fit into the individual boxes everybody had for me. So it was kind of needing to be this person for the veterans, needing to be this person for the black community, needing to be this person for, as a father, this person as a, and it was just like, it was like insane because the demands that everybody had to be the perfect person in their puzzle piece for their life just took a toll. And it almost was as if I felt like I wasn't even living my life. I, I, I wasn't living my life. And I had, um, I remember I saw this play once and cause I grew up in a Baptist church, you know, my family's very strong into to Christianity. And I saw this play once and it was about a train to heaven. And the play was basically trying to say, follow Christianity to get to heaven in a sense. but. But the part that was very like telling for me was a guy showed up to get on the train and he didn't have a ticket. What he had was he said, my grandmother went to church every Sunday. And, and they said, but what does that have to do with you? And he was like, no, but my grandmother, she really was into the church. She did this. And, and he was using all of everything his grandmother did for him to try to get on the train, but they wouldn't let him on the train because it wasn't his, you know? And it, that struck me and I realized all of my beliefs had came from what my grandmother, my mother, and my father had told me. Like I had no real beliefs of my own at that. I had, I, I really just took what they said, my aunts, my older cousins. I took what they said and just went with it and never challenged anything. And so it was like unfit was the challenging of the norms. It was like, put everything about your life in front of you and challenge it all the way down to your damn name. Like challenge everything. If it's true, it's going to stand. That's a part. If it's not true, it's got to go away. And that was kind of like what the principles really opened up for me because I was trying to take out the bricks on my back one at a time. Like this told me a quick release strap, drop all that shit at once. Like it was over. Like if it don't work for me, I'm, I'm done with it. 
you know, if 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 for some reason me and you and Marie had a problem, I'm on the phone like, hey, I'm sorry, baby girl. Like, what we need to do? Like, how do we fix this? What? Because that was not my intent to offend, to to discredit, to 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 silence. Like, what do we need to do so you know I want your voice is heard as my voice is heard? You know, and and if that's outing myself as asshole, then by all means, I'm outing. You know, can I curse? I'm so sorry. I ain't even asked that. Um, I don't mind myself. Okay, okay, okay. All right, I, I didn't <laughs> ask. I get to rolling. But yeah, no, it's it's like really, really. Uh, Michael Michael says something in in creating the impossible, which is why I love that book so much. He says, "Make the how does it go? Make the invisible visible, and that will make the impossible possible." So for me, that said, we can't see love other than by demonstration. So I am going to demonstrate the hell out of it <laughs> and, and see from that demonstration, see what becomes possible. And I see it happen in my race relations. I see it happen in socioeconomic gaps where I could talk to the wealthy and because I'm not wealthy, there's no problem. I could see it talking to gang members and I'm not a gang member anymore. I could see it talking to the police. I'm no longer the police. Like I could see loving each person that's their own and how that creates the possibility for us to know this truth about the human experience i'm just thinking i did have a question and then i got distracted by my dog because she's like running around <laughs> she just settled down now and maybe she doesn't start barking again um I did have a question and it's totally gone out of my head. So I'm going to open it up or somebody's just put a thing on the chat. If anybody's yeah, got that... a question, you can just unmute yourself. Oh, that's Sandra saying he has to go. And I'll just have a quick look and hope and see if the question comes back to me. If not, if anyone's got any other questions or comments. Um, oh, this question might come back into my head in a minute. I don't know. I'm doing, I'm just going onto YouTube on my phone, so. Um, Thank you, Xander. Safe, safe, be safe, man. Francis looked like he got a question. Oh, Thank you, sorry. Safe, safe, be safe, man. Yeah, unmute yourself, um, Francis, if you've got a question. <laughs> or do Francis I have to? Like, no, I don't. No, he didn't have a question. I was just picking with him. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear this. I got you. Yeah, how you doing, man? I'm really good. I just, I haven't got, I didn't have a question, but I obviously did <laughs> um, because you saw it. No, I, I just, uh, I wanted to jump on because. Um, Came across you, I don't know, a few months ago, I think, Rob, and I'm going to keep this really brief, but you honestly are a, a huge guiding light um, for me. Um, I just, I have to say it, I was like, I just feel like you should be the, the, the voice of this whole thing <laughs> somewhere out there. Oh, um, you, you, I, I, I shared something that you, um, I shared one of your po the podcasts, oh, I can't remember, the one before the one with George Franklin. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but um, anyway, just amazing. And I shared it on my group and, um, you know, I said, you, you speak with such just calmness and, and wisdom and, and um, yeah, I love you, man. It's just absolutely brilliant. I try to tune in whenever I can, it's busy at the moment, but um, just keep doing what you're doing. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's you and, you know, um, People, just ordinary people. I think this, the funny thing about it is that it, what it seems to be happening now is that people used to look to the big hitters, the Michael Neals and the JP mm -hmm. Jacksons, and, but now it's just, it has a life of its own. It's kind of spread. And now there's people like yourself and there's this lady called Sarah Costin, who's written an amazing book. And Sarah, I was in school with Sarah. No. I, yeah, I did coaching. Uh, it's Sarah, I had a, did an episode with Sarah too. Uh, oh. Songbird, know. is it the song, the book about songs? She just wrote a book. It's called the book that I have seen. That might be true, but the book I've seen is called "You Are the Blue Sky." Yes, you are the blue sky. Yes, we did an episode about that one. It's brilliant. It's like you. She shares mm -hmm. 
really gently, she said, shares her story um, and how her life has changed, but also you know, interwoven with um, you know how she sees the principles, how the principles work for us, because uh, for her. And, and and that's the thing about this this beautiful understanding is it's not prescriptive or it's not it's not something to pin down because it was basically showing you back to yourself. So mm-hmm. that there isn't any way you can script that. Mm-hmm. Someone has to see it for themselves and then they share what they see, and that's going to be unique for everybody. So I'm going to shout, but you're doing an amazing job, and it's absolutely awesome and i'm so glad i could make tonight um my one of my sons is with me going what are you doing Dad? Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah anyway so thank you so much rob no thank you man for for all the kind words but yes sarah uh beautiful beautiful spirit beautiful um and we you know we we talked michael talked about this the other day at a at a on um a getting real course he's had talked about the evolution of the principles and, and how he saw it and it's funny because I used to ask questions about that. Because uh, again, there's no like, it's not anywhere you go and solid, get the history of how it went from C it's, you know, initial initial insight. But we are coming up next next year, 2023, on his 50th anniversary of the insight. And so the board, we have some things we're going to do. Um, but it will be a, a beautiful time to set the foundation for the next 50 years of the understanding. Because you're right. At the beginning, there were the big names. And, and those were the first, as we call it, first generation, those who actually study with Sid or those who were mentored directly by him. And so they were perceived as most as who would be the best to do it. And, and in a sense, I kind of understand that. It's kind of like if I'm going to start a school, I want to make sure my teachers, you know, are educated first. So I'm going to be hard on them. I'm going to make sure they do this. I might be a little more strict on them, too, because they're going to go out and teach this. You know, they're going to extend this past me. And so now what has happened, though, is they've done such a great job. And then the world in itself has begun to change with the use of technology. And you couple those together. And what we have is a global community that became global much faster than anybody saw. (laughs) And so there's these gaps, these gap spots of like, oh, wait, you can actually make it to living by the principles without even hearing about Sydney Banks now. Like that's possible for people. That's the explosion, right? And so we want to make people all aware, you know, of the source of where it comes from, but then to still let it develop and let it grow because it is each individual seeing themselves. You know, I say often there is the principles and then there's the articulation of it. We're ever only really arguing about the articulation because the principles just are like, that's that's the truth. That is, it ain't nothing to argue with there, you know? Uh, we're only talking about the conversation or the articulation of it. You know, you say you make the visible visible when you use this word, when I use that word. So who gives a damn? Like we're talking about the invisible. OK, so, yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that. I remember the question I was going to ask now. <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking. I'm, I'm just interested in religion and the three principles, just because um, I know Sydney Banks um said that if you are religious he said he wasn't religious but if you are religious (laughs) carry on um practicing your religion um because they're all saying the same thing and i've had pushback from a family member a long time ago i've I've seemed to have talked around now um where she was sort of implying three principles as a cult so i don't know if you've heard people describe it as a cult Oh yeah, oh yeah. I actually responded back to somebody once that that said it was a cult. I was like, okay. I said, well, Brent, you bringing that to my attention is pretty cool because now I've been in a gang and a cult. Like you don't get to say that in your lifetime. Like you know what I mean? Like those are two different extremes. You'll never get to say like I was in a gang and a cult. Like you know. So yeah, nah. And um, do you? I don't. I know you said your family was um, practicing, Baptist, Catholic, Protestant. Do you still practice your religion alongside three principles or are you just fully well now? i want i i to say to practice with would just say at times there are pieces of christianity that come through me because i've i've been i've been rooted in it in a sense but for me the principles are well before we start talking about the form of religion anyway like again everything about the principles for me are invisible they're, they just make sense of how my creative power of thought works in, in my human form. 
I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. It's, that's just explain. That's all it does for me. After that, I have no more use for the principles at that point other than remembering it. You know, now that shows up as me as a father, husband, veteran, black man, this and that. And I have to remember that truth to go through this life, you know. So um, as far as me, you know, waving a banner for any specific way, I, I don't have a banner I raise, but I'll tell you, I'm all about anything that is about loving people and putting them in a better position to live their life. You know, I, I was at a, a moment one of the, when I was challenging everything. I'd study with a Muslim um, rabbi. I don't know what, what their official term, is. I'm a chaplain, that's what I call it, a Muslim chaplain. And I remember getting a, a busy mind because he didn't try to convert me. And then I thought, I started thinking something was wrong with me. Like, like no, like he must don't want me to be a Muslim. I must not be fit, you know, like, oh man. And he said, he told me that when I asked him, you know, busy mind, why are you ain't trying to recruit me, man? What's wrong with me, 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 you know, about me, right? Um, the way he answered the question was, why would I confuse you? Because if, if you really believe you are a Christian and you live it, then the world would be a better place. I just really believe I'm Muslim. And it was like, huh? And I, I didn't know what to do with it. You know, I, I had no clue what to do with it. And it, that didn't settle for me to years later when I read in the quest of a pearl, when um, um, they're in the quest of a pearl, I think I can't remember my name, Mama J, I want to say Mama J, but that's Jacqueline Hollows. But the, the lady in the book, the, who the book is around, um, the wise old woman in the book talked about her grandfather and a person um, coming to visit their village who was of total different belief than a grandfather. But they sat and laughed and ate dinner and joked and had a great time. And they didn't argue at all, even though they had opposite beliefs or whatever. And she questioned it. And his response to her was that we both know the truth, which was we both know there's something much deeper to life than what we believe. And since we know that, our beliefs don't really come into play because we stay in that space. And so um, I'll, I'll speak at a church with, without a problem. I'll speak in a jail. I'll speak at a sober living home. I'll speak at a strip club. You get me there. Like, I, I don't care. Like, I really don't care uh, other than just, you know, expressing this love that you can have for yourself that, that just doesn't make life so anxious, doesn't make it so hard. Don't, doesn't mean shit's going to stop. Like, we're going to experience life, like, death of loved ones, problems with your job, businesses trying to grow. Yeah, yeah, that's part of it. But man, it's a, a lot less intense way to absorb some of that um, with this understanding. <laughs> Molly's trying to put her tongue in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's my dog, Molly. Um, and I'm getting distracted because of my dog partly, but also has anybody else got any um, questions um, for, or comments from what Rob has been saying so far or what we've been talking about? I'll just check, check YouTube again, just in case. And if you, you can put, if you don't want to talk on camera, because obviously this is on YouTube live, you can put a question in the chat. Oh, yeah, Francis, just unmute yourself. Happy for you to unmute yourself. Just uh, just while we're filling time, I just, I'm just interested in, when did you come across the principles, Rob? Uh, 2018. Okay, so you, uh, you've, you might have already done this and you did touch on it earlier um, when you kind of talked about, um, you know, meeting Michael and having that experience, but could you kind of talk a, a bit like a, about the actual, experience because you kind of set up like the event but what did you oh what was the drop point yeah that bit, yeah that's okay that's the bit i'm quite interested in you know in terms of like different <laughs> stories of, of what people saw i have my own experience and so yeah could you just talk about that got it absolutely so um a few weeks before that that intensive with michael um i was transitioning from being a personal trainer to stepping into teaching corporate wellness and being a speaker and, and, and stepping on stage just talking about health and this company 
which um, manages manages so many uh, billions of dollars of assets, somehow, some way, their seat, one of the, the um, head people of the company heard me speak. And next thing you know, they wanted to book me for um, to come out and talk to their top level executives. So they put me up in this super posh hotel, you know, free everything. I mean, and, and it was the most money I've ever paid, I've ever been paid to speak for one hour. Like, it was like, wait, just, okay, wait a minute. You, you want me to say the stuff I was saying? Or you, I need some new stuff. Like, cause is this for, you know, so that's, you know. Well, when I got to the event to get ready to speak, I show up about 30 minutes early and I'm, I'm in my head, not because I'm scared to speak. Like I'm not, never, I'm really cool with that part. I was in my head because of how much money they gave me. I thought I needed to say something special. And I didn't realize that the only reason I was there was because regular stuff I was saying was special because that the CEO heard me and he pulled me in from, from, from that. But in my mind, I got to do something special, something big. So I create a PowerPoint. Now, I don't know if you've ever followed me, but you've never seen me with a PowerPoint. Like you've never seen me with a PowerPoint. Right? I, I, don't even, I, don't, I make up the shit when I talk on stage as I go. So let alone trying to follow these slides. But I, I do this PowerPoint. And I get to the place, um, it's about 20 minutes before I go on, I give the thumb drive to the tech guy and they, they do some little stuff and I'm sitting there, I'm, you know, catching the vibe of the room and, and they kind of, hey, hey, we can't, we can't get your, your PowerPoint up. Now, again, I just told you, I don't even like PowerPoint in the first place, but for some reason, my whole mind shut down. <gasps> my PowerPoint don't work. Hey, let me try it. Let me get it. Now, I don't know nothing about tech. So here I am, fat fingering on this man's computer, trying to get this thumb drive to work, which I can't. But at this point, it's now time for me to get on stage. And so I stopped hitting the, camp, the, the man's keyboard and just decide to go without it because we can't get it up as he's saying my name. And, and then as it kind of he introduced me, I start coming up, it pops up on the screen. So, but before I ever go on stage, I used to play like a couple hip hop songs and just kind of like bang out, vibe out real quick and then walk on stage, super excited, right? So I didn't get a chance to do that because of the fact of worrying about the PowerPoint. So I finished up the speech. They loved it. They pay me. They invite me to speak at another event in New York. I'm on my way home. And Low acts. Lo says to me, she says, baby, you okay? And I go, yeah, yeah, I'm just concentrating. Like, give me a minute, baby. You know how I do. Like, let me get in my zone. Let me get ready for this. And she's like, pull over. And I was like, what? It's like, pull over. And I was like, oh, God, like, hey, like, let me, let me get ready. Like, let me, let me, you know, get in my zone. Let me get. And she was like, it's over. It's over you've already done the speech. And I was sitting in the driver's seat of the truck like, wait. I looked down at the check and I was like, it's over. Like, why do I feel like I'm about to go on stage? Like I'm going through the whole, I know it. I know, I know what I feel like very well. This is exactly the ritual I step on stage with, exactly how I'm feeling, talking myself into it, getting ready. But I've been on stage done on my way home now, right? And so it was at that point, Michael said something in intensive. And I was like, oh, 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 wait, wait. I got a question. I asked him that. And he said, oh, I can explain that very easily. And he got up on his board and he, he explained to me thought. And wow, it just fell there. Yeah, because it was, if thought was real, there would be no reason for me need to, to work myself up once I had already done the speech. He was like, that was, the, I, that was a habit that I was doing at that point because I was used to doing it. It had to come in, like it's a habit, it's boop boop. But it was the awareness of, oh no, wait. If, think, if my thinking was, was could be trusted, my, the content, let me say it that way, because I do like making that, that delineation. Me personally, Rob, I like making the delineation between the power of your thought. That's your creative power. That's the only thing you can take something from the form list and bring it into form, headphones, microphone, computers, any of that. 
And then there's the content of our thinking. That's the, I'm a horrible person. Oh my God, nobody likes me. My nose is big. You know, I need to lose weight. I need, that's that, the content of your thinking. That, that's not what I'm concerned about, right? Um, but the power of your thought. But the content of my thinking is not to be trusted. And that, that is what I saw. But once I stopped trusting it, it opened up a lot of bandwidth for me to see some other things that were true. It was like, oh, you can do that. Again, make the visible, make the invisible visible. And then the impossible becomes possible. So that, that was the story that, that was it. You um, just reminded me of something that happened to me earlier on today. So um, I can get a bit insecure if I'm given feedback and somebody, I won't go into detail of it, but somebody gave me some feedback on one of my blogs and I could felt myself and I managed to stop myself because obviously I'm part of the three principles community. So I know it's not real. But I found myself, I started to get, get a bit depressed because I was starting to take it so personally. You started taking it, yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking, yeah. this wine in my fridge, should I drink the wine? I said, no, I can't drink the wine because Rob's, <laughs> I've got to do this thing with Rob in an hour's time. <laughs> and, um, and I managed to just ride over it. And I think what the three, well, talking personally, what the three principles has given me, I, it doesn't stop me from thinking or feeling the things that I'm thinking or feeling, but it stops me from mm -hmm. hanging on to them for so long. So like a mm -hmm. depression that might have lasted a week over one comment that somebody said to me now lasts maybe half an hour. I don't know whether you've um, found that as well. Absolutely. That's um, when Francis was talking earlier. He was, I think you were talking about the, the episode, Francis, where I was going through all the things I had just recently learned. Yeah. OK, so. When, when I was at the 3P UK conference, so the, the lineup was Dr. Bill Pettit, Dr. Judith Sedgman, Michael Neal, Miss Beverly Johnson. Like, I was like, are y'all kidding me? Like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm on stage. Like, what are you, what, what? So, but what was so interesting was being in the van and, and, and being around all of them when we went to dinner and things like that, like we were going to be one time, the vans had us about to be late for our presentations because of traffic and this stuff. And you, and they got worked up like I got worked up. The only problem was though, I stayed worked up and it was like in two seconds, they was back down and laughing again. And I was like, still up here. Like, you know, it, here's what it felt like, Emery. On your mark, it said go. And we all running as fast as we can and y'all stop running. And then I'm still running like, oh, 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 we not running? Oh, we going back? We going back to start? Like, oh, okay. And then I got to run back and catch up. And that's when I noticed there is no difference between us and those who we call elders other than how fast they remember the truth. That is it. It's like no matter what hits them, the level of their experience and the things that they went through in life, the only thing they have on us is how quick they get back to truth. And it, it, because it almost looks like they don't even have a beat. It, 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 if you don't pay close attention, you will think they never get mad. You'll think they never get angry. And that's how that, that, that false narrative of you don't really understand the principles if you have emotions and if you get affected. It's because you look out across the board and you see some people who look like they're always at constant, right? It looks like they're always at even keel. And it looks like that because you don't see how quick they went up and down. You're so used to the line, like you said, being me and you, the same for me too, you know, being a week long, they like two minutes. And I mean, quick. And it, it, that's, I learned that in the UK. When that was, so that was this summer, June. That was like, oh, I don't have to. And, and it really, it really, it really grounded me. Because the, the other thing they taught me was because I was hanging on to the doctors and all the initials and letters after the name and things like that, Dr. Pettit said to me, which, which really, really kind of melted my heart, was like, I love your lived experience. And it hit me. My lived experience is my education. My lived experience is my education. That's all I'm ever talking about anyway.
I don't need to get no more educated on how to be shot at. I don't need no more. I'm good. <laughs> I can pick up every other, I can pick up any story you want from here on out about that. I don't need to feel sad anymore to teach you about sadness either. Like I got, or depressed or shitty. Like I got enough days and, and counts of those, right? So now I'm gonna find as many ways as possible to, to really enjoy this experience. And I'm gonna use those, you know? Um, so yeah, I I really, really have seen that and, and that conditioning and, and listen, sometimes it's okay to follow that because when you come back aware, it's all that boom. Like I was riding down the street probably a couple of weeks ago and I was on one hell of a thought train to the point where I was right about trying to cross over into sadness, right? And I was just about to be sad for some shit I made up now, like totally made this up on my drive, right? Uh, actually, what it, I remember what it was. A truck was coming down and it stopped, but it was such a big truck, it kind of was doing the vibrations. And the first guy out on the other side was a motorcycle. So when the, when the light went, you know, this light goes red, this light goes green. So the truck is like, and then the motorcycle just takes off, still not knowing if the truck was fully going to be able to slow down or not, but he crossed him. He made it. The truck stopped. There was no accident. But because I saw it on the way home, I created, oh, my God, if that man would have been hit by that truck, his family. And I'm just a crime. I'm like, I'm like, what the hell are you doing? You don't know that man. Would you stop? Like, it was like, and then I just bust out laughing. I literally just bust out laughing because I spent about 10 minutes on a made up story. For, I didn't give this man a name. I didn't give him kids, you know, all kind of shit. You, I, I don't know this, man. I don't know the truck. I don't know none of that. But I gave all of them a story and cried about it. And then when I saw what I do, it it was just the funniest thing. Like, oh, dude, you, you, ooh, that was a good one. Like, you really tricked yourself with that one. But I didn't get mad about it. I really just laughed at it because that's how it all is for me. You know, just remembering. I, I don't care how long I ride the train. If I believe it, I'm riding it. It's just when I wake up to it, it's like, oh shit. Man, I'm sorry. Like I cry for you, I don't know you, you know, <laughs> keep it moving. I'm all right. <laughs> You're talking about that it makes me think of movies because I know in three principles I often use metaphor of movies of the mind and mm -hmm. you know what and um you you requiring to that term makes me think it's almost like you're watching it like it was a movie because you know you can watch movies and get emotionally invested and you can mm -hmm. cry or get angry or scared. And it's also reminded me that um the film now this is a bit of a segue, but anyway, I'm just gonna go for it because it's come to mind. Um I was born in 1969 and in 1974 the film Jaws came out and I would have been five and I'd never seen the film Jaws and I'm frightened of sharks even though I've never seen the film Jaws and I'm frightened you, you the same you're exactly the same and I still won't watch it when I was a child the, the sound came on the you know it was on the television when I was a child the sound da -da, da -da. Da -da. <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm out of the room and I'm still like it I'm still scared of it. I mean, I, like, I mean, I'm now 53. I was nearly 50. Um, I left my last full-time job when I was 50. And I mentioned it to some people at work. And they started playing it. Well, they're guys, because this is what guys are like, and I don't want to be sexist, but generally men don't be like this. <laughs> that would be some dumb shit we would do. That is, the, yeah, that would be, <laughs> so they she's scared watching, of that, so I'm going to play it. Yes, Yeah, that exactly. They started watching it on YouTube. And I was like, no, I'm not watching it. I'm not watching it. I'm not watching it. And I was sort of like, almost wanted to run into the toilets. I didn't, but I was, I was sitting there, like at 49 years old, with my fingers in my ears because I didn't want to hear. To the, you know what I mean? And it's just so stupid. I know it's ridiculous. I know it makes no sense. It makes a lot of sense. But you say you're the same with yours, are you? It's, uh, I'm telling you, it makes a lot of sense. So. <laughs> the scariest, I, it's a program I have now, but the, a fear program I put out. Mm -hmm. So when I was challenging my boxes of fear, I had to look at the scariest thing I was scared of. And that was jumping out of an airplane, a perfectly good one. I probably could fix myself if it's going down, that why I needed to jump then, I probably could figure, but a perfectly good plane that can land, like why was I jumping out? So that was, and mind you, again, 21 years in the military, I was in airborne units before. 
you know, where I was supposed to jump, but my knees was hurting or my back was hurting, you know, <laughs> whatever excuse I could come up with not to do that. But I, I end up jumping. And here's what, what I know. All the way up was scary. The moment they told me to turn and put my feet outside the plane to get ready to jump was the scariest I've ever been in my life. Like, I don't, I don't know of any other time that reality just did not work because you, you also notice at the top, unless you've done it before, you also notice that you've never been in midair on an airplane with the door open. Like, because you hear how loud it is and the noise, you're like, huh, I've never had the door open on a plane. Matter of fact, why is the door open on the plane? Like, because you see the ground, you know, and it's, it's weird. But that wasn't the crazy part. The crazy part was being so scared, can't get any scared, and then actually jumping, right? So I'm jumping. And at first, it feels like it wasn't a good idea to do this and that it was very dumb and fears are real, okay? Fear, you know, for the first few seconds. And then all of a sudden, I pushed through that fear to where it was fun. Like, I'm like, oh, this, okay, this ain't that bad, right? But the part that really, really punched me in the face about fear was as we were coming down, I, I did the whole in the GoPro cam, thumbs up, smiling, licking my tongue out, you know, all that shit. But as we were getting ready to land, the guy says to me, all right, Rock, I want to tell you about landing. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to lift your legs up. And it dawned on me. I had been so scared about jumping out of the plane that I never asked a question about how we land. That's the most important fucking thing you should want to know when you jump out of an airplane is how you land, right? I never asked that question <laughs> because I was so scared of the jump. And the realization was, was when you believe fear, you won't even go after information that's most applicable for you to be alive. Like fear can consume you to the point where you're not asking the necessary questions you need to stay alive. Not because you don't want to, because you can't see it. So yeah, I'm just like you. If, 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 if jumping out of the plane would have been da 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 I'd have ran to the bathroom too at 40, 50 or whatever age we are. Like, that's why I say we're the same. That's what I mean. You can replace my jumping out of the plane. Yours might be clowns. Like I know people who are scared of clowns, right? Uh, yours may, it doesn't matter what the fear is. I'm saying fear in itself. When you feel, when you, your body starts experiencing fear, you get tunnel vision and you stop asking the right questions for yourself. That's all I'm saying. Like, that's what I mean when I say we're the same. You just made me think of something else as well. They, um, it's not a metaphor, but I know when people drown, it's often because they panic and they start mm -hmm. flailing around. They start flailing around. Mm -hmm. Drown. But if you actually relax and just sort of like let yourself float, mm -hmm. which I mean, I'm not a very good swimmer. So I think if I was in that situation, I may well go down the panicking route. I don't know. But I know that you're supposed to just sort of like let yourself float and sort of, you know, go with oh, it. Yeah, that's what allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> listen, we, that, listen <laughs> that's, this is, oh, that, that is one of those things me and you both intellectually understand. Yeah. But it ain't in our heart yet. Right? Because yeah. I, I want to say I'm calm enough that if I'm in the water and I'm about to drown, that I'm going to just lay back and let myself flow. I want to say that with you, Anne-Marie, but I don't know if 100% I'm with you on that, right? Because I have been in the water before and lost my shit. So I don't know, right? I really don't know. I, I would want to. I am intellectually aware that that's the best for me, but I can't promise you I'm going to perform that way. And that's the difference a lot when I'm talking to, to people in the community or outside of the community. Like, listen, some people say they get the principles. And, and I, I, I try to distinguish between when it's intellectual versus when it's, when it's the feeling, because the feeling is going to move you no matter what. Right, intellectual, it's, it makes questions, it got to make, be logical. And I'm not that logical anyway, I don't think. Like, you know, so I, I wouldn't work out, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pair good if logic was my way of having to move, you know? So no, that's very, very, a very good example of, intellectually versus heart <laughs> it's like yeah if we drown and we we're gonna lay back <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, when it comes to reality, <laughs> but don't know until you're in it, do you? I know. Uh, so we've got 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to leave the last 10 minutes. I noticed there's some messages. I don't know who they're from. I'll just have a quick look. Um, but just in case anybody's just got any questions or comments, if not, I'll wrap it up. Um, thanks for the comments. Um, I've had a couple of comments in the, I won't mention their names because this is on um, YouTube Live, but um, somebody said brilliant and another person said, love that example of getting back to truth. So thank you for your feedback. And um, if anybody else has got any questions or comments, or if Rob, if you've got anything else you'd like to add before we close. Uh, Francis, are you gonna ask another question? You, you have yeah, if anybody's like... got a question, I, I would love to. I, I feel like we didn't, I was just- Hi, can I, can I say yes. something? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, sorry, I'm not gonna, I'm lying in bed. It's uh, 6.21 a.m. in Sydney here, so. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for getting up that early. How about that? Uh, I appreciate I'll that. Tell you what, a lot of you guys in the US and UK, including like my class with Mavis or a lot of, or anyone, even Dr. Petit, Dr. Pettit and every all of you guys started your times. And for us in Australia, it's a bit like, oh, here we go, 3 a.m., 3.30, <laughs> 4 a.m. and this. And so now I, I, my simple wisdom is, don't get involved unless it involves a recording. So that's it. <laughs> I if I wake up, and I don't put alarm because if I wake up, I wake up. If, if if I put the alarm, I won't sleep waiting for the alarm. Wait for the alarm. Absolutely. I love that. I and really love just, that. <laughs> yeah, it's just wisdom. But I, I, yeah, thank you so much for your warm presence, Rob and Anne-Marie. I've been following your Medium articles, I think. And, and it, yeah, it's just brilliant. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to ask, I guess, was I, I'm 57. I, I come from various backgrounds. I've lived in five continents. I was born in Kenya, in East Africa, uh, the, the Indian origins of different cultures, different colors, different. I lived a long time in the UK, boarding school in rugby and uni and this and that. I had nine and a half years in New York City, a lot of education, a lot of intellect, a lot of proving your worth as two things in our family, being very clever, and how much can you add to the coffers? Two things. And the rest is all, well, crap, according to the minds that, you know, <laughs> yeah. the rest. And I personally, my personal was in, when I was a little kid, there was an English writer called Enid Blyton. Now, I loved the world of fairies and elves and goblins and, uh, and this and that. When I was a little bit older, my music was Donny Hathaway, Donna <laughs> Summer, uh, Marvin Gaye. I was in Kenya as, what, six years old, and I was listening to Donny Hathaway and, and, and the Four Tops and all that sort of stuff, right? Old soul. Now, everything I did, everything I grew up was an anti or whatever my surrounding was. So, you know, Africa, Indian, even England, but everything I was was other than where I was, mm. sort of, in a way. Although I knew at heart where I felt comfortable, where my heart lay. And mm -hmm. as I say, even when I grew up, I did my degrees in economics, masters in marketing, vet oh executive programs and all that but in my heart narratives story humanistic psychology meaning carl jung and eric Fromm and edler mm -hmm. uh literature uh travel based on my interest in the holocaust human nature uh even the works of tuskegee alabama and booker t washington uh, education, Marcus Garve, everything which involved the higher side of human. At some point, everything, my false self and the real, whatever you want to call it, the, the one which felt at home were clashing. And now that's not the reason, but I entered addiction like alcohol. And, in, and, it, and it managed to strip away, a lot, as they say in AA, rock bottoms, and then you can start doing something about it. I moved to Australia as a geographical to get away from everyone. 
And, and, and it was here three years in that I went to rehab and 15 and a half years later, I'm here in, in what we call sober. Now, this is a, I'm trying to cut it short because of the time, but the thing is, this brokenness, and let's not call it brokenness, there's such a label or a belief. Yeah, I don't because think we have got innate well being. Mm -hmm. But this is the real, re this is when we're all the searching, and I love searching, don't get, I love seeking, I love history, <laughs> I love lessons. But it got me at some point to three principles and live participation over time with Nicola Bird, with Aaron Turner, and every Friday with Judy Sachman and Christine Heath, because their timing is a God-given 9 a.m. here, and it's a beautiful conversation all, every Friday. Then with Dr. Pettit, uh, you name it. I mean, all, all your old guys and new guys, I mean, it's just that <laughs> I'm always... And the pointer is in me. I know the wisdom is within, and I go where there is resonance. Mm -hmm. Because you can, and then I found out one insight that when I did enter the three principles, I entered through the coaching three principles world. And I realized I was entering through the doing bit because I, my whole mindset was you're not doing anything, you're bullshit, you're this, you can't, you, you, left, you left the whole life of corporate family business. Now you don't know shit. What are you going to do with your life? Where, what are you going to do with philosophy? What are you going to do with love? What are you going to do with uh, innate well? All the, the brokenness. Sorry, I'm still calling it a label, although I don't mean it. <clears throat> yeah, I get you. It's creating angst, the feeling of uselessness and a little yeah. bit of self-pity and everything. And I know these are pointers as Judy and they can, Mavis, eight months of Mavis Karn, and she says, you still believe your own thinking, don't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I go, maybe it's how easy is it for you to drop it? I just can't. But mm -hmm. she goes, you come, you're just one step away. Just keep mm -hmm. on going. So Absolutely. I just wanted to ask you, I loved it. You answered my question the way when the other gentleman asked you, what dropped it for you? Yeah. And I'm still waiting for the big drop. But it yeah. just might be a series of little drops. Anyway, I've talked enough. Sorry. No, but I do want to, I, I will hit on something you did when you talked about um, the consumption or the overuse of, of alcohol and things like that. Mm -hmm. Because I, I too, I too, I went through, I've been in and out of so-called in the rooms, uh, AA, substance abuse counseling, things like that before. I've, I've had well, I was actually a coin collector. And I think I got up at one point to about nine years of sobriety. Mm -hmm. um, all of those were well before the principles. When I came into the understanding of the principles, I'd realized why I was drinking in the first place. It wasn't us that my system was broken because I went to drinking. I did just like anybody else who was overwhelmed in their thinking, tried to get out of it. And drinking just did that very quickly. Mm. Right. I probably would have chose drugs if the military wouldn't have been so bad on them. <laughs> I, you know, like so it was your system works. The system is working just like it's supposed to. You're overwhelmed. Your thinking has gotten you off course. It's what we do when that awareness becomes that that kind of gets us gets us caught up. And so I was choosing alcohol to just get to sleep. I was choosing things like that. But once the stress of my life, the divorce, the PTSD counseling had settled, the things started falling back into place, I realized I didn't even drink. Like I didn't drink. And it was like, not, not because anybody was telling me or not because of anything. It was just, I didn't just feel like the need to do it. Oh. And that's when I stopped having to deal in and out of it altogether. So now for my life, I drink if I feel like it and I don't if I don't. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make me feel like I'm a once an addict, always an addict or whatever. Like I used to really leave AA feeling like, and, 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 and at, listen, AA makes some tremendous impact and helps a lot of people, you know, keep going. Yeah. But for me, it made me want to go drink. Like leaving meetings made me want to go get drunk. Like, cause I felt like a POS, you know? I'm sorry, Anne Marie. We're at the time, right? I know. Yeah, yeah. Francis keeps putting his hand up, so I think he might have a quick question. <laughs> go, so, Francis. Go. 
spot. <laughs> Really, really quickly, I just I saw a video when I about five years ago. I, I came across this in the, at the end of 2016, and one of the first things I watched was uh, there was a clinic somewhere down. There's a three P centre down somewhere down in Florida, somewhere of uh, fantastic women are, are running this, and uh, they had this guy on, and they, they they encouraged people to do little videos of like their experience and how it had affected them. And this guy came up and said he was like 27. And he, and he did this short little video and he said, um, you know, he's explaining how he was a heroin addict from the age of about 16 until he was about 25. And he'd been mm. heroin for two years. And he said that when the, the, the principles, he's, and he just said this one thing, he said, I suddenly realized I didn't have a heroin problem. I had a thinking problem. A thinking problem. Yes. And, and <laughs> so it was amazing for this guy who'd been racked 11 mm -hmm. years. It was yes. nice taking heroin, thought he was going to be a heroin letter forever. And he just got it. He realized mm -hmm. it wasn't, he wasn't addicted to heroin. He was addicted mm -hmm. to his thinking. <laughs> yeah. uh, needing to get out of his thinking. Yes, he needed to get out of that. I mean, it's just that. like, there are people who go to the gym and work out three, four hours a day. That is one of the most unhealthiest things you can do for your body. Yeah. It's too much wear and tear. It's too much stress, but they're trying to get away from their thinking. Right, right. A CEO, yeah. a CEO goes into the office, will forget anniversaries, will miss birthday parties and dive into 18, 19 hour shifts at work yeah. to get away from their thinking. Yeah. Yeah. But we said, that's cool. That's OK. That's passion. <laughs> that's passion. Yeah. Yeah. His life is falling apart, but we're giving him kudos for passion. No, he's just as caught up as in his thinking as the kid over here drinking the booze or taking the pills. Yeah. Like it's the same, man. Christine Haight also, she is a term, just as you, you guys are saying. She, when I mentioned this, because I'm very open about this, because it's, it's principles, we can talk about our innate thing. And she said, if, there's one so, if there is one society I would belong to, would be Overthinkers Anonymous. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that sounds like something Auntie Chris would say. Yeah, that definitely sounds like something she would say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. But it's good to see it, allow it to be and know the, and, and see the uselessness of this Absolutely. whole part of, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for your lovely presence, Rob. No, and thank everyone. you, man, for sharing. And I know thank we're coming you. up on time. So before we do that, Anne-Marie, I just want to say thank you again so much for the invite. Truly, okay. truly enjoy showing up and, and hanging out and, and being able to kind of just speak on different side of the world, you know, yeah. about this understanding. So I uh, thank you so much for this. And I love talk, um, talking to you and listening to your stories as well. So it's great. And thanks for everybody else who's attended. And um, I will close it down now, but thanks and bye. <laughs> <laughs>